Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kathleen Lesson, and I would love to welcome you to today's LEARN online symposium. I am going to be uh, sharing information about stress reduction for lymphedema. I'd like to begin by thanking the Lymphatic Education and Research Network for allowing me to share this information all around the world. And uh, these are the generous support of these sponsors help make the 2024 LEARN Symposium Series possible. So a very big thank you to all of our wonderful sponsors that help us. Um, and here's a disclaimer, uh, this information is provided for use by you in consultation with your healthcare professional. It's not meant to take the place of healthcare or services that you may need. Definitely talk about all this information with your primary healthcare provider. So who am I? I'm a lymphedema therapist and I'm in private practice um, in San Diego, California. I'm also board certified in therapeutic massage and body work. Um, I have a yoga teaching and meditation background, and I'm the author of a book called Stress Reduction for Lymphedema. And I've spoken at several conferences, um, including AVLS, NLN, and FDRS here in America, and the Society for Oncology Massage. The objectives of today's presentation, we're going to discuss the effects of stress on the lymphatic system. We're going to discuss and demonstrate breathwork techniques and mind-body exercises, and I'll hopefully inspire you to get those into your daily self-care practice. And we're also going to describe and demonstrate a breath and movement practice for upper limb lymphedema. So let's get right into it. I love to start my presentations off uh, with some breath work so you can really feel how this does affect your body. So let's start with a practice called cyclic sighing. Um, and the evidence behind this practice is in a great paper. Um, some of the authors are from Stanford University right here in California. Um, and they find that doing uh, this cyclic sighing is has an increase in your positive affect, provides psychological relief, a shift in your autonomic state. We'll learn more about that later in the presentation and a resetting of your respiratory rate. And even more exciting, the effects are cumulative. So the benefits are gonna increase as this exercise is practiced regularly in your daily routine. So let's try it. So I'll invite you to begin in a relaxed yet alert position. Your eyes can be open or closed, and then I'll invite you to exhale fully and then breathe in through your nose. And when your lungs feel full, take another shorter breath through the nose to fully inflate the lungs like this. And then exhale slowly. So we're going to do this practice for a total of three breaths, so two more times, but you could also do it for five minutes as a regular practice. So we'll go ahead and inhale, little extra inhale, and a long, slow exhale. And then final inhale, that little extra inhale. And exhale. So you can return to breathing normally. If your eyes were closed, you can blink them back open. And uh, just feel inside yourself for a moment. What was the change in just taking those three breaths? How did it change the way uh, you feel in your body right now? And part of that change is the topic that we're going to talk about right now, and that is what is stress? So I love this image because we have a uh, cheetah and her spots, and then we have what she wants to have for lunch, which is the poor deer. 
So both of these animals are experiencing stress in this picture, but stress is different experience to each of them, depending on if you are the cheetah that is motivated, that wants to get into this situation, that wants to run, that wants to use that high heart rate and um, getting all the blood to the muscles to achieve a goal. And then the poor deer here, who does not want to be in this situation, did not invite this stress into their life. It is not productive for them. And they're just trying to escape with their lives. So stress occurs when a situation is perceived as uncontrollable, unpredictable, distressing, or feared. So this, this stress is what the deer is feeling. Um, the negative effects of stress are going to come from what the deer is feeling. When a person's well-being is threatened because the situation is exceeding their coping resources, they're going to react with negative stress. And this negative stress reaction triggers physical, psychological, and social discomfort, which is observable at the brain, at the endocrine level, and at the mental levels. So how does stress affect our lymphatic system? This is a presentation for people who have uh, lymphatic disorders. So how is stress affecting our lymphatic system? So I like, I love these two images. It's the image of the fire truck on one side and the recycling truck on the other side. And you can only have the fire truck on the road or the recycling truck on the road of your body at one time. And the fire truck is this stress response uh, where the body is sending the fire trucks out to go and put out the fire wherever that fire is on your body. The body is in high alert and it is focused on saving itself. And the recycling trucks have to pull over to the side of the road so the fire trucks can get in. And the recycling truck is your body's way of maintaining its homeostasis and lymphatic system is part of that, uh, the rest and digest mode, the um, getting the, the bodily processes to where they should be so you have nice homeostasis. So when those fire trucks are there, when we feel stress, our lymphatic system is not going to work as effectively because the nervous system and the lymphatic systems are interlinked. So how do mind-body practices work to try to reduce stress from these stressful situations, from all those fire trucks um, on the road in our bodies? Stress-related disorders may occur because of an imbalance in the autonomic nervous system with overactivity of that fight or flight sympathetic nervous system and underactivity of the parasympathetic nervous system, which is that rest and digest that time in the body when we can get those recycling trucks out. And mind-body practices may work by normalizing the imbalance in the autonomic nervous system and increasing the parasympathetic nervous system. So here's the big chart um, of all the different ways that the sympathetic nervous system has an effect on the body and the parasympathetic nervous system has an effect on our body. What we basically need to know from a lymphatic standpoint is the body's sympathetic nervous system innervates the peripheral lymphatic system as well as the secondary lymphoid organs and the larger lymphatic system in the gut. This is how the lymphatic and the nervous system are interlinked. It's because the nervous system is actually innervating the peripheral lymphatic system. So the sympathetic nervous system expresses the fight or flight response, which is pro-inflammatory. And the parasympathetic system has an anti-inflammatory effect on the organs and the entire body. So this is how our lymphatic system is listening when the, the sympathetic fight or flight action fire truck nervous system is turned on in our body. How else can it affect our body's lymphatic system? This is an image of a cancer cell. And scientists in Australia have demonstrated that chronic stress can change lymphatic vessels and cause tumor cells to spread faster. So what else can affect our lymphatic system? Interesting to note that hypertension and lymphatic dysfunction are linked. 
Japanese researchers found that the contractile activity of lymphatic vessels is functionally impaired with the development of increasing blood pressure when they tested this in a mouse model. So there's very good advice on keeping the blood pressure low, on controlling hypertension, because the contractile activity of lymphatic vessels may be being impaired if we have increasing blood pressure in the body. So we've looked at several reasons and I've hoped I've made really quickly a good case for you to add reducing stress to your to-do list. So let's look at some clinical practice guidelines on the use of integrative therapies during and after breast cancer treatment. Um, as a lymphedema therapist, so many of our clients are coming to us for treatment and they have a breast cancer history. So this is good to know that these have been elevated up to actual clinical practice guidelines. And the guidelines state that high levels of evidence support the routine use of mind-body practices for our clients, such as yoga, meditation, relaxation techniques, and passive music therapy. And these can all address common mental health concerns among breast cancer patients, including anxiety, stress, depression, and mood disturbances. So if we have a client walk into our office and we're seeing that they are dealing with anxiety, stress, depression, and mood disturbances, we can turn to these clinical practice guidelines and start this conversation with our client about the routine use of mind-body practices. So in the article, Lymphedema After Breast or Gynecological Cancer, Use and Effectiveness of Mainstream and Complementary Therapies, it is noted that half of survey respondents reported using complementary and alternative medicine therapies to treat their lymphedema. So if you're a lymphedema therapist and you're thinking, hey, all this is great, but you know, is there gonna be some pushback when I'm talking to my clients about these mind-body exercises? Really take a look at the research that's already been out. And this research is over a decade old. And even over 10 years ago, half of respondents in a survey, they're already interested. They're already using some of these uh, mind-body treatments to treat their lymphedema. So this, I hope, should give you confidence to go ahead and start that conversation with our clients. So let's try um, one of the research studies that I found that might help people when they're having uh, CDT. So it's the wrapping when we um, treat people at the beginning of their journey with lymphedema. So this is called progressive muscle relaxation and the effect of relaxation techniques on edema, anxiety, and depression in post-mastectomy lymphedema patients undergoing a comprehensive decongestive therapy. This is a clinical trial. It was uh, involved 31 women with breast cancer-induced lymphedema in Iran. And the researchers found that the addition of this intervention, progressive muscle relaxation, for the treatment protocols used for highly stressed patients with lymphedema is therefore recommended. So what that means to me is if I look at this research, hey, if I have a client that comes into me for CDT and they are highly stressed. Um, they have edema, that's why they're there, but they also have anxiety, they might have depression. This might be something that we can add to their CDT that they can use for their self-care that will actually make a benefit over just CDT alone. So let's dive into this research and really take a look at it. So this clinical trial compared to CDT alone and then uh, progressive muscle relaxation over nine weeks, and they found that it leads to a greater percentage of reduction in depression, anxiety, and edema volume in women with lymphedema. So the significant overall trend of changes in anxiety and depression showed that the effectiveness of relaxation techniques um, had an improvement in the client's symptoms um, over the control group. So let's take a look at the protocol. Uh, the protocol was that the client would begin at the head and end at the feet. 
They were able to either lie down or sit down comfortably in a quiet area where they wouldn't be disturbed. They started by taking a few deep breaths and then they squeezed each of their muscle groups in a defined sequence for five to seven seconds and then they relaxed for 10 seconds. And the overall practice from the head to the foot of squeezing all the uh, different muscle groups in order took them about 10 to 15 minutes. So like I mentioned before, if we the invitation is if we notice that a patient is really having a tough time with CDT or as we're doing that initial um, evaluation of them and then booking them into the CDT, we see that this may be a client that could benefit from this. We can just ask them, would you like to try a stress reduction technique before your appointments for CDT. So let's get right into it. And like I said before, I love to get hands on with these things and try them ourselves. So let's take a minute now and practice progressive muscle relaxation. So it's gonna be about five seconds with the scrunching the muscles and then seven seconds with relaxing. So we'll go ahead and scrunch our forehead just scrunch, scrunch, scrunch for five seconds. And then relax. Squeeze our eyes shut for five seconds. And relax. Scrunch our nose like the little girl. and relax. First, our lips. And relax. Tense all the muscles in our face. And then relax. And just take a moment here and feel the heaviness of our face. All right. So that was just a taste of this progressive muscle relaxation for the full 10 to 15 minute protocol. They'll go through all the different muscle groups in the body. And uh, the great thing about this is there is there are links on the internet um, on YouTube where they can be guided through with this YouTube video of a 10 to 15 minute progressive muscle relaxation um, routine. And so what I would suggest is if they could come in 15 minutes before their appointment, we've seen that you can just sit uh, quietly while doing this and then put the headphones in and do this progressive muscle relaxation while they're waiting in the waiting room before their appointment for CDT and um, in a quiet area of the waiting room. And then they can kind of come in to the appointment. It doesn't add any additional time on our books, but from them coming in just that 10 to 15 minutes beforehand, they can add this simple mind-body practice to their decongestive therapy. Okay, so let's look at another practice. This is called slow breathing. So what we've seen with the research is that breathing at the rate of six breaths a minute equals a breathing frequency of 0.1 hertz. So what is so special about 0.1 hertz? Slow breathing can reduce the secretion of adrenal medulla norepinephrine and it can reduce sympathetic nerve excitement. So again, it's a different way to get us away from that fight or flight, negative stress response, and into the parasympathetic stress response. Uh, changing our breathing pattern can change the autonomic nervous system activity. So let's practice this, slow breathing, inhale of five and exhale of five. So I'll invite you to sit in a comfortable position again and a straight spine. We call it in meditation class, like relaxed yet alert. You can close your eyes if that feels comfortable or leave them open and softly focused. 
and I'll guide us as we inhale deeply through the nostrils, if you can, or your mouth, and then exhale slowly for five more seconds. So I'll go ahead and start us inhaling. Exhaling. Inhaling. Exhale. Inhale. And exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Let's do one last inhale. And exhale. Okay. So how do you feel in your body after that short um, practice of inhaling and exhaling? This slow breathing is seen in different cultures all around the world. Um, this breathing with 0.1 hertz, the in breath and the out breath totaling 10 seconds. Um, we see it in yoga breathing where they may have a four second inhale and then a longer six second exhale. And interestingly, um, I'm Roman Catholic and reciting the rosary in community um, is a way of incorporating slow breathing in that the recitation of each Hail Mary prayer takes 10 seconds. Um, and the, if you, there's one person that will lead the recitation with the first half of the Hail Mary, and that takes five seconds. And then um, as the leader exhales, the, the congregation will say the second half of the Hail Mary, which takes five seconds. And then they'll each be inhaling and exhaling as the other person says the prayer. So this is a wonderful study I enjoyed reading. Um, it's called, I Never Heard Anything About It, Knowledge and Psychosocial Needs of Latina Breast Cancer Survivors with Lymphedema. And the study qu is quoted as saying, women often perceived religion and or spirituality as a source of emotional support, both through participation in church groups and through prayer. And one woman said, I pray using the rosary and that has comforted me so much. So this study found that psychological outcomes improved when Latinas had social support, used active coping strategies and participated in faith-based practices. And this in part goes back to one of the missions of LEARN, which is why I love having this presentation today, that LEARN has chapters all around the world where uh, people with lymphatic diseases can seek social support from one another. Here's uh, the 10 second breath in another culture, chanting Om Mani Padme Hum slows breath breathing to about six breaths per minute and well as enhancing heart rate variability and barrier reflex sensitivity. So we really see this across the world in different cultures. So let's start um, one of my uh, most, the, the one that I really like, um, these breathing practices, it is called alternate nostril breathing. Um, and the Yoda protocol for the treatment of breast cancer related lymphedema includes alternate nostril breathing as part of the protocol. And yoga management of breast cancer related lymphedema randomized controlled pilot trial also includes alternate nostril breathing as part of the protocol. So we'll go into Vishnu Mudra. So we just use our right palm facing towards you and we'll place the tips of the index and middle finger at the base of the thumb. And then the thumb and the ring fingers help you close off east nostril. So I'll, I'll invite you again to sit in a comfortable yet alert position with a straight spine. And you can close your eyes if that feels comfortable and place your right hand held in Vishnu Mudra beneath your nose and inhale with, through both nostrils. And then you can close the right nostril as you exhale through your left nostril. And then inhale through the left nostril 
Release your thumb and close the left nostril with your ring finger and exhale through the right nostril. Inhale through the right nostril. Release the ring finger and close that nostril and exhale through the left. And then repeat as much as is comfortable and we'll do it for about a minute. Just following these steps one through four. And then wherever you are, just finish that breath off and exhale comfortably. And then if anyone has any questions, please put your questions in the Q&A box um, instead of the chat box. And we're going to get to the questions after this. And yes, this will be recorded. So you will have um, access to this slide to be able to practice on your own. Indian researchers designed a study to test the effects of different types of nostril breathing on heart rate variability, skin conductance, breath rate, and blood pressure. So their protocol with alternate nostril breathing was five minutes of sitting quietly, 30 minutes of the breathing practice, and then five minutes of sitting quietly again. And those researchers found that a session of just nostril breathing through the right nostril resulted in an increase in systolic, diastolic, and mean pressure. Uh, nostril breathing just through the left nostril increased, it resulted in a decrease in systolic and mean pressure. So the blood pressure went down. And then alternate nostril breathing, which we just practiced, resulted in a decrease in systolic and diastolic pressure. So it was very interesting to see how we can um, affect our blood pressure by which nostril we breathe in. And this is reflected in um, Indian wisdom uh, where they call the different nadis, uh, Ida Nadi and Pingala Nadi will flow through the different nostrils in the nose. So right uni unilateral force nostril breathing is associated with an increase in sympathetic tone which sometimes when, um, if I have to like get to work, but I'm just not feeling it, I'm kind of tired. I really need um, the effects that would be like, you know, from a cup of coffee, just something to wake me up, uh, but I don't have one. I can try some right nostril breathing just to kind of increase my focus and be able to um, participate in activities, even though I'm a little bit tired. Interestingly, prior research, um, has found that right nostril breathing increased blood glucose and that left nostril breathing lowers blood glucose and left nostril breathing increases the volar galvanic skin resistance, um, which is, is suggestive of a decrease in sympathetic activity. So women with arm lymphedema, uh, so this is the next thing, uh, Thing that we're going to practice. Women with arm lymphedema who participated in a 10-minute standardized arm exercise and deep breathing um, experience a reduction in their arm volume, in their arm heaviness, in tightness, and in pins and needles feeling. So this is especially if we're lymphedema therapists and a client comes into us and says, you know, I'm feeling heaviness, I'm feeling tightness, I'm feeling pins and needles in the arm. I want that to kind of set the wheel, the wheels turning and kind of think of, uh, is this a good patient to share this information about the uh, arm exercise that we're going to do next? So let's look at the study, um, the effect of gentle arm exercise and deep breathing on secondary arm lymphedema. It's a breathing and arm movement. 
So we're gonna start by placing our fingertips at the sternum with our elbows elevated, and then inhale, and we're gonna stretch the arms laterally. Same that five second inhale again. And then for two seconds, we're gonna hold our breath and tighten the arm muscles, and then exhale and return the fingertips to the sternum for five seconds. So we'll repeat it for four more times. So inhale for five. Squeeze for two and exhale for five. Inhale for five. Hold for two. Exhale for five. Inhale for five. Hold for two and exhale for five. Let's do one more. Inhale for five. Stretch those arms laterally. Hold the breath and tighten the arm muscles. And then exhale and return the fingertips to the sternum. Okay, so we can put the arms down. So they, uh, the study had the patients doing it 25 times in a 10 minute session. Interestingly, one minute of these exercises that we just tried were incorporated into a 10 minute holistic self-care protocol for patients with breast cancer related lymphedema. And that study will be in uh, the bibliography for this presentation. That's a really interesting uh, 10 minute holistic self-care practice. It also includes um, an exercise called Tyso and then also some self-massage with essential oils. Very interesting study. So let's talk about Hydro FE. I love this study. I actually met one of the authors um, at the conference in Italy that I was I was at. I presented at last year. Um, so this focused on people with lower extremity swelling. They completed two 50-minute sessions a week for a total of five sessions of pool exercises. And the researchers found that aquatic exercise stimulates both the neuromuscular and the metabolic systems, positively impacting the psychological side of our clients. They found that this intervention reduced lower limb volume and feelings of heaviness and increased their ankle range of motion. And the best thing about this, I absolutely uh, treasure fellow authors that have uh, had that give free full text so everyone could look at the full text. Everyone can see the details of the protocol um, and they're right here in this link. Okay, so let's look at different mind-body exercises. Researchers conducted a systematic review with a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials on the effects of mind-body exercises like Tai Chi and yoga on heart rate variability and perceived stress and found an overall large effect of Tai Chi and yoga training on perceived stress. And four of the seven studies included in the meta-analysis demonstrated significant reductions in perceived stress. So this is some really strong evidence um, that we should feel confident in sharing Tai Chi and yoga with our clients. So let's look at uh, Qigong, which is a type of Tai Chi, and it's uh, the clinical practice guidelines on the evidence-based use of integrative therapies during and after breast cancer treatment state that Qigong is often used for anxiety, fatigue, pain reduction, immune system support, and physical and emotional balance improvement. So this is a gentle type of movement um, that would definitely be accessible for a lot of our clients. Researchers from Hong Kong conducted a clinical trial and found that Qigong exercise performed by people who have previous training in Qigong could reduce conventional cancer therapy side effects such as umfer limb lymphedema and poor circulatory status. So this should give us the confidence as lymphedema therapists. If our client already practices Qigong, this may be an excellent um, 
thing to encourage them and say, if you already practice Qigong, you already love Qigong, this is something that you can incorporate as part of your lymphedema self-care. So let's look at yoga as a yoga teacher. I love recommending yoga and uh, definitely tune into one of the past uh, symposiums from Learn with Babs on yoga specifically to get more information. Um, this study that I looked at uh, found that yoga may be of benefit by reducing both the physical and psychosocial effects of lymphedema. And a systematic review of systematic reviews for interventions following treatment for breast cancer found that exercise and yoga likewise have shown effects on anxiety, depression, and quality of life. Researchers from the Mayo Clinic in the USA sent questionnaires to over 800 people, and 63% of the respondents state that they used yoga in their self-care. Almost 90% of respondents stated that yoga helped improve their symptoms, and the most common symptoms that prompted the use of yoga were breast, chest wall pain, lymphedema, and anxiety. So I want this to give you the confidence to start that conversation and see if your clients want to try out yoga. Because interestingly, fewer than 10% of breast cancer survivors said that they had been referred to yoga by a medical professional. And we have enough evidence that we can confidently recommend yoga. And why are we recommending yoga? Because the lymphatic system, which is so dependent on body movements, benefits from yoga because of the movement but also because yoga can control the autonomic stimuli causing the muscle, muscular walls of the collecting lymphatics to contract. Mosley et al. found that forms of exercise that incorporate deep breathing and arm exercise, such as Tai Chi, Qigong, and yoga, may also be beneficial for post-mastectomy lymphedema sufferers and may be useful as an adjunct treatment along with CDT. So what are we using for adaptions? Because we can't just throw our clients into a hot yoga section. Um, adaptations include, we're going to talk to them about avoiding heavy loading of the affected arm. Uh, we're gonna talk to them about restricting static postures and be incorporate more movement into their yoga sessions, encouraging continuous movement, including breathing exercises. So you breathe, in a certain part of the position, you exhale in a certain part of the position. And they can adapt floor-based postures to offer a seated or standing option. And they can begin with postures and movements that include clearing the lymphatics of the trunk. And again, we have those resources out there. Definitely um, watch that other online symposium from Learn uh, with Babs and she'll tell you, get into some real specifics about yoga. And I always like to end the presentations um, with this resource. There are adverse effects to mindfulness um, and it's, it's interpreted differently in different uh, belief systems. But if your clients come to you and as you are educating your clients about mindfulness, they may come against some adverse effects. And this is a really great resource, um, Cheetah House in America, uh, for researching and um, giving them the resources they need if they're experiencing adverse effects of mindfulness. So thank you very much. Um, this is my uh, contact information. You can find me at KathleenHelenListen.com and you can also find uh, more information on Instagram at stress reduction for lymphedema. And I will go out and do videos uh, where I sh model for you the breathwork practices, some of the practices that we've talked about today. So if you list include them into your feed. Um, you can be scrolling just like usual. And then one of the beautiful breathwork practices for lymphedema will pop up and you'll get a chance to take a three or four breath mindfulness break. Okay, so I am going to stop sharing my screen and start taking some questions. Um, thank you all for going through this presentation with me. Um, I see some of the thanks um, 
for the symposium, and I am going to look at some of the questions on the Q&A. Uh, we'll have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, yes, uh, someone asked, the techniques are being presented slanted towards breast cancer lymphedema. These techniques should help all those dealing with lymphatic disease, or is this totally being applied to those who developed after breast cancer? I love this question. What we see with the research is, Breast cancer gets funding for research. Um, so most of the research that I found is um, targeted towards people with breast cancer, but everyone has a lymphatic system and the lymphatic system works throughout the entire body. So the breathwork practices um, that I talk about will benefit people uh, with all types of lymphedema. So yes, thank you very much for that question. I noticed that too, as I went through um, the, the research that there's a lot more for breast cancer related lymphedema as far as research. So yes, uh, again, Judy asks, are they consistent with leg lymphedema? And I would say absolutely. Um, I, so someone wants the link to hydro FE. Um, I don't have it on this computer right now, but when you see this, um, in the learn, um, when, when it's taped and on the LEARN website, you will be able to see the link there. Um, any studies including positive effects of walk, water exercises and upper body lymphedema after breast cancer, an example of water exercises to do? That's a that's a really good um, question. I don't, I did not see any specific uh, water exercises for upper body edema and breast cancer specifically. Um, we definitely recommend water exercises, um, but I would definitely love to see more research on um, specific types of lymphedema and specific types of water exercises. Um, but as a lymphedema therapist, we're always recommending water exercise. The benefit of water is that um, you're able to have a range of motion and comfortable range of motion that maybe you wouldn't have on land and that the, the compression of the water increases as we get lower in the water. Um, so it's it's definitely of a great benefit to people have lower um, limb lymphedema. Judy asks a great question. What are some examples of adverse effects of mindfulness that we may need to watch for? Um, so a big one is dissociation. Um, so they will not feel like they are themselves anymore. Um, and this is it's I this is why I have the link for Cheetah House because there's it's such a deep topic um, that it's hard to um, have in a tiny um, in in just like I answer you in two or three minutes. Um, but what we'll see is. Uh, it's interpreted differently by in different um, religious beliefs. So in like Christianity, sometimes it's called the dark night of the soul. Um, and uh, sometimes it's called um, part of the path of self-realization. Um, but we're looking for them to have a positive experience with their mindfulness without having any negative experiences of um, the symptoms of any kind of mental illness. Um, so I'm always saying if someone has difficulties, if someone has a trauma history, they might, when we ask them to sit quietly and close their eyes, um, they might have traumatic flashbacks. And if that is too difficult for them um, to continue meditating with, that is at the point when um, they can seek a meditation teacher and have a more formal practice or seek um, like a mental health therapist that can help them talk through um, those problems. Um, and it's really good because now universities, um, I learned, uh, I started my formal mindfulness practice by going to UCSD and they have a center for mindfulness and UCLA has uh, Mac, they have like a center for mindfulness. So if you're uh, live in a large town and you have a large university, look into that university and see if they have like mindfulness based stress reduction, which is a formalized eight week practice for the instructional mindfulness. That would be a really great um, 
entrance for people who want a formal uh, training in mindfulness rather than just, you know, trying to grab a meditation off a free app. Um, someone asked, how can we tell if we have lymphedema? Um, you'll need to get a formal uh, diagnosis by your doctor. Um, and they may send you to physical therapist. Um, if you suspect that you have symptoms, either your oncologist or your physician can send you to a physical therapist. This would be something um, that you can look on the Learn Patient Resource Center and get more resources for your community. Um, how do these exercises help lymphedema in the leg? That's a great question. So exercise helps lymphedema in the leg um, by getting that joint movement in, which helps the lymphatic system and also the mind-body practices. We move away from the sympathetic nervous system into the parasympathetic nervous system. And we I tried to sprinkle in different, um, different research studies that spoke about how having the parasympathetic nervous system, having a mind-body exercise is actually going to help improve our body's lymphatic system and the pumping. Yes, I love this question. Do I consider spending in time in nature having benefits for lymphedema? Yes, and I talk about that in the book. Um, there are so many different aspects of spending time in nature that is so great for our body and our um, body's lymphatic system. And the first of all is that it calms us down. It helps that uh, it helps that parasympathetic nervous system get in control. And uh, we can see it firsthand by you just, you spend some time in nature and you take that hike, right? And when you come out, you're just so revitalized. You feel like a better person. So Linda asks about um, finding the resources. This uh, talk is going to be recorded and it's going to be in uh, on the LEARN website. So you will be able to um, access the information on it there. And I will also have it on my website, which is KathleenHelenLesson.com. I'll have a copy of the slides up in a few days. And then Willa shares that the Tidhar exercises are geared for both upper body and lower limb. Um, this is an interesting question. For those patients who are neurodiverse, such as ADHD and autism, would I expect different mechanisms and breathing exercises being beneficial, or do I expect no difference? I don't expect the lymphatic system to work differently with the breathing. Um, they may have a different um, reaction to different breathing uh, exercises. So that would really be someone um, who is a professional that knows about ADHD and autism would be a really great person to ask about that. So what massage would not be recommended for lymphatic drainage to avoid? Um, so this is gets right to the heart of um, if you have a uh, cancer history, um, you need to go to someone, in my opinion, that is um, skilled in oncology massage because we learned that we're in an in-person 40-hour um, class. And then I was in a, uh, I went to and did my um, practicals at the Moore's Cancer Center. So I am well-versed in how to um, protect the lymphatic system and the client that has, is going through a cancer journey or has a cancer history. Um, if you have lymph diagnosis of lymphedema, definitely ask your certified lymphedema therapist for a referral to a local massage therapist. Um, some of the very deep pointed work um, can have a negative, possibly a negative effect on uh, your lymphedema. Any suggestion for yoga poses specifically for lower leg lymphedema? This is a great question for Adrian. I love this question. Um, Babs can help you. Um, and she has so many resources. And I believe she even does a class on Monday. That's a drop-in class. 
um, on yoga for uh, lymphatic yoga. So definitely look into her and it's on the Learn website, her presentation and all of um, Babs's resources. And she does that online. Um, and again, we're looking at the adaptations, which are, um, we're going to start out with some movements that clear the central lymphatics. We're going to focus more on movement, less on static poses. And then if some of them are too, um, if some of them are overwhelming, um, we can uh, switch to from the floor to the chair um, or do some more adaptations to make them more accessible for people um, in different bodies or, or different uh, stages of lymphedema. And then Melanie asks, what is passive music therapy? That's a great question. Um, so you're not actively playing the music. Okay, so I feel like I have hit all the questions and all my questions are done. Um, so thank you very, very much for um, spending this time with me, for sharing the deep breathing exercise with me. Um, when this uh, is posted, I would love for you to share this with your friends and with people that you think it would benefit. It's wonderful that all these researchers have done this research. So if we can get the word out to um, everyone who has a lymphatic system it, uh, about this very valuable research that the researchers have taken their time to publish, um, we can um, improve everyone's life and give everyone so many great ideas for self-care practices that they can add to um, their lymphedema treatment um, that involve these mind body exercises and this breath work. And thank you very much to uh, Judy. She said, this is the best learned training I participated in. Thank you so much for offering it. Um, and yes, I will make the recording resources and bibliography available to share with others. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone.